Good evening, sir, and my colleagues. Today, I am presenting the case of of Mrs. X. She is 80 year female, housewife, and resident of Delhi. History is given by the patient herself. She is presented in a hospital on 18 4 24 and was examined by me on the same day. Patient presented with complaints of swelling of both feet since three to four months. I would like to take back my history to 2017. Patient was apparently all right till 2017 when she noticed swelling of both feet, both lower limbs since two to three months, which was insidious in onset and gradually progressing. It started from feet and it extend, over a period of two to three months, it extended up to the knee joint. Initially, the Swelling used to subside with rest, but over a period of time, it used to persist throughout the day. Patient also noticed puffiness of face, especially of periorbital region, which was more during um, the morning hours and then decreased as the day progressed. Swelling of feet was not associated with any shortness of breath, palpitation, orthopnea, syncope. There is no history of jaundice poor appetite, abdominal distension. There is no history of decreased urine output or blood in urine. There is no history suggestive of lower urinary tract symptoms like nocturia, urinary urgency. There is no history of easy fatigability, weight loss, or any bony pains. No history of oral ulcers, skin rash, and joint pains. No history of recurrent upper respiratory tract infections or sinusitis, no history of any chronic illness like tuberculosis or allergies, no history of diabetes, no history of chronic NSAIDs intake, and no history of any indigenous medications. For her complaints, she consulted a local physician and was found to have high blood pressure and she was started on single tablet, tablet Terma, plus one more tablet, which was probably a diuretic. She does not remember the name, but on putting leading questions, she was able to give history of increased frequency of urination. At that time, her blood tests were done, and she was told that her tests were all normal. Her edema reduced initially, but after three to four weeks, again, it started increasing. This time, her swelling extended up to the knee. She consulted a nephrologist. She was told that she was leaking proteins in urine. The amount of protein in urine, she is not able to recall. At that time, a kidney biopsy was also done. And she was started on tablet prednisolone. Her swelling decreased gradually over three months. But she was continued on same medication for, an, for a period of three more months and then the medications were stopped. She re remained asymptomatic, but again in September 2018, she noticed swelling over her feet and was given tablet prednisolone again for six months. She was also diagnosed with diabetes and was started on an oral hypoglycemic agent. She remained asymptomatic for four months in June 2019. Again, she had similar complaints of puffiness of face and uh, edema of legs. Each time, she was given the same tablet prednisolone for six months. Meanwhile, her blood sugar also worsened, and she was started on injection insulin plus one more tablet. In 2020, 24, she developed difficulty in swallowing, which was painful, and she was not able to take solid food and was on soft and liquid diet. This, this was not associated with any vomiting and difficulty in swallowing liquids. She developed swelling of both feet also, which progressively worsened over four to six weeks. She, she was started on tablet prednisolone, but she could not take those tablets and always had vomiting after taking the tablets. 
This is which mm -hmm. year? This, la this is in 2024. 24, Jan January. And from January, she started developing symptoms. She okay. was started on the... She then came to a hospital and was hospitalized in April 24, where her kidney when her kidney biopsy was done. And now she was started again on tablet Visalon and one uh, tablet Tectrolimus, and her swelling started decreasing. Patient improved on follow-up in uh, May 24. She noticed that her swelling had Just decreased that. over the... Thank you. Start from in May 24, she hey, noticed just, that she... Just, just one moment. Uh -huh. Yes. When she was 73 in 2017, she started with edema, three, four months. Right? And then she was given steroids. She was dosed, she doesn't remember. With that diuretic, she improved. No, okay. Not much associated symptoms. She was not hypertension. She was detected hypertension at that time, at the age of 73, first time. Then six months of steroid. It was stopped after six months. Did you mention it was tapered and then stopped? What is it? I mean, first episode or any other episode? No, sir. What, she's so not, not able sure? to. Re okay. re then in 2018, had probably again recurrence of proteinuria. Again, given, but this time she was also detected to have diabetes in this, this second episode of proteinuria. Found to have diabetes. Yes. yes. And you can steroids. Yes, yeah, steroids, six months. 2019, one more proteinuria episodes. Again, six months. Okay. Then in between, did you say that uh, dysphagia or a swallowing difficulty, you specified it was more for solid and less, for, not for liquids? Yes, sir. And did it uh, disappear? It was painful. It was managed at that time. Any history that it got better? So Sir, with those symptoms, she was start, uh, she also developed swelling of feet and she was started on steroids. But uh, she could not tolerate then. She had persistent vomiting. Then she came and got admitted in our hospital. In this April, March. So this, this happened here, 2024. Again, a recurrence of proteinuria. And dysphagia finished? Dysphagia, no. It, mm -hmm. uh, dysphagia, it didn't complete probably. The, what happened to dysphagia? Said that uh, with those complaints, she okay. was admitted in a hospital. Mm -hmm. She was evaluated. Her, and sorry, after some medication, her dysphagia improved. Let her carry uh -huh. right. And uh, she was started on uh, tablet by alone and tactolimus. And she was uh, <coughs> discharged and was advised follow up. What was the medicine she was given? Visalone and Tacrolimus after the second biopsy. Sir. Second biopsy is done 24. Okay. 2024. March. May. Sir. May. Two biopsies. Yes. Uh, during follow up, her swelling decreased, but she noticed that this time her swelling of over the left lower limb persisted. And which was, the swelling was not painful and not associated with fever. In OPD basis, it was uh, evaluated and was di uh, diagnosed with the varicose veins and she was referred to a surgeon. That's all the history of presenting illness. Past history. No, no, let's stop at presenting illness. I got it. So what has she presented? Let's hear from you. Who are the third year students here? Yeah. So what what has she presented? Recurrent of the disease. No. This 80, now 80 year old lady has come with swelling of the face and feet. So what do you make out from the history that she's presented from 2017? 2017 it started, no? Yeah. So when a 73-year-old lady, she says, has come with swelling of face and feet in 2017, what more would you like to know in the history? 
because she is given a very perfunctory history. What more would you like to know? Okay, then. So basically, you would like to know of systemic involvement. Yeah. We are not only thinking of kidney. We are thinking of some disease in the elderly which can come with swelling. So what are the things that you must look for in the history? Would you like to look for other constitutional symptoms? Weakness, easy fatigue, fever, low grade fever, they could be even a emergency yeah. other than long grade weakness. Um, Good, then carry on. Jaundice, would you like to look for? Ask history of jaundice. You would like to ask history of jaundice? Okay, then. History of bleeding from any sites. Good, very good. You would like to ask history of weight loss? So the whole idea is that when an elderly lady has come to you with anasarka, then you start looking for a cause. You know, one is you are thinking of nephrotic syndrome. All right, you are thinking of nephrotic syndrome, but you are not thinking of primary nephrotic syndrome. Primary diseases you are not thinking of at this age. You are thinking of secondary diseases. And in secondary diseases, besides the idiopathic disorders of the kidney, you must think of malignancy, you must think of anything else? You must think of, you must think of some constitutional disease, no? Like one we said malignancy, second we know an elderly age group, could she be a diabetic? Very good. So you must think of diabetes. Third. I'm not necessarily telling you in the order of preferences, but I'm just, as it is coming to my mind, we are discussing. Malignancy, we spoke about solid malignancies, hematological malignancies like myeloma. Then he said whether it's a diabetes which has been missed, a little unlikely, because she would have come with a different history if she was a diabetic. She didn't come with that. Now, why do you think of amyloid? Why have you come up with amyloid? I would have thought of cardiac history like she mentioned. Yeah, yes. this is my patient in cardiac failure? Is my patient having chronic liver disease? I would think of these things first, no? And then go on to other things that you are thinking of. Elderly people can present with multi-system disorders, no? So you must always keep that in mind. Take the history of arthralgias. Take the history of rash. You gave us all this history? Yes, sir. There was no history of shortness of breath, palpitation, orthopnea, and synco. Plus, I gave history of no history of jaundice, poor appetite, and abdominal distension. No history of decreased urine output or blood in urine. No history suggestive of uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. No history of easy fatigability, weight loss, or bony pain. So what were you thinking of? when you took this history? So, when I took this breathlessness palpitation, I was thinking of any congestive cardiac failure. Okay, one. Then, rule out any GI causes, like CLT, you know, everything with swelling. Okay. Then, easy fatigue, weight, weight loss and bony pains for to rule out any Malignancy. Okay. Especially then phone. Then I took history of oral ulcers, skin rash, joint pains. Yeah. To rule out? To rule out vasculitis. Okay. Then history of uh, recurrent upper respiratory tract infection also I took with skin yeah. ulcers. So just tell me, when she spoke about vasculitis, is it common to have? What vasculitis were you thinking of? So suppose this lady had come to you with uh, rash, <laughs> she had come to you with rash in this age group, elderly age group, coming to you with body rash, 
and some kidney involvement. What is the thing which is going to run in through your mind? Will you think of things like Hinoxionlin purpura in her? No, you will no. not think of, no. Then? And then she also has some ischemic changes in the hands. And you are thinking of chronic liver disease, she also has some hepatosplenomegaly. Make a guess. So, elderly age group, when they come with kidney involvement, if this is not, I'm, I'm sorry I came in between the history, but if they come with kidney involvement and they come with rash and they come with some other organ involvement, besides what we have discussed, always keep cryoglobulinemias in mind. That is something which you tend to miss. Unless you don't think about it to exclude it, you will never think about it. In the elderly, always keep it in mind. Okay. Then? So what's your diagnosis at the end of your... You completed your past history or some other person? Mm -hmm. that you're going no, sir. End of history then. We'll see. So what no, is your clinical diagnosis at this stage? So, elderly lady with the... Here, with the mind you, I have not gone into the treatment she took. Because mm -hmm. once you go into the treatment she took, then your whole differential diagnosis narrows down. A elderly lady with multiple times swelling of both feet, with the no urinary hematuria or decreased urine output, no symptoms suggestive of any cardiac illness or liver pathology. And response to steroids? And response to steroids. Most probably a nephrotic syndrome, a second... You think of a glomerular disease, disease. no? Yes. Presenting as nephrotic syndrome. Yes. Right. Now, which is the nephrotic syndrome you will consider which responds to steroids? Which glomerular disease will you think of which is responding to steroids? Children generally and... No, now you've got a 70 plus elderly lady. So what is responding to steroids? It's a minimal change disease. Okay, MCD. Then FSGs, mem membranous. Membranous. You think of minimal change, you think of membranous in primary glomerular disorders. Somebody mentioned about amyloid. Do you expect a response? Mm. You don't expect a response with steroids in amyloid, no? Yes. So we'll talk about amyloid a little later. Okay, so you think your patient could be having a glomerular disease? disease. You think it could be either MCD it or membranous. membranous? So now next step is at this stage you must start thinking about is it a primary glomerular disease or is it secondary? So you must search for this in the present history and search for it in the past history. So did you get any clue? So, no. So what are the causes of secondary? Let's say it's membranous. What would be the causes for secondary causes for membranous? So, infections. So let's go one by one. Who would like to take? You would like to answer all? Yeah, come. Infections, infections like hepatitis B, HIV, hepatitis B, or Okay, so chronic viral infections. Okay. Autoimmune diseases, especially Okay. Would you like to add to that? So, so any indigenous day. medicines like which contains heavy metals? Medicines. Hmm. 
Would you like to add to it? Yeah, heavy metals like? Gold. Then? Gold, mercury, gold. Okay. So you would like to think of a secondary cause. When you think of malignancies, particularly, let's come down. Which are the common malignancies in women which can present as membranous? Sir, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Okay, so you would think of hematological malignancies like lymphomas. One, then? Carcinoma breasts. Any solid yes, organ malignancy can come as with membranous nephropathy. Yes. Okay. Do you expect it to respond to steroids? No. So it would not be responding to steroids. How would it respond? It will respond to the specific treatment, sir. So you treat and the nephrotic state yes. subsides? Yes. Okay. Carry on now with your... Sir, past history, she underwent vaginal hysterectomy 30 years back for DUB. Then she underwent cholecystectomy 20 years back. There is no past history of hypertension, diabetes and tuberculosis. Family history, there is no family history of any kidney disease in the parents, sibling or in children. Personal history, she is married, has four children. She is para 4, like 4 and takes a mixed vegetarian diet, non-smoker and non-alcoholic. From past history, nothing is significant. Not contributory. So we are left where we are. Okay. Examination. So let's stop at that while she is searching for the examination. So what is the difference between... Uh, the pattern of glomerular disease in children and in adults? The histological patterns in children, histological pattern in adults. Yeah. Now we are talking about nephrotic syndrome. So it would be the first. And in adults? In adults, it would be the membrane of the Okay, so that's an important thing. Anybody is aware of any study from so Northern India? India okay, so what was their study? So they had uh, kept the FHGS was the number one cause in that. That means that So, yeah, so there's a little difference. While from PGI Chandigarh, they said it was FSGS. Yes, sir. From Olinia so Institute, yes, Olinia Institute, the thing was a little different in percentages compared to the primary, what was there in uh, PGI Chandigarh. Okay. Yeah. On examination, patient was average built, efebrile, pallor was present, bilateral pedal edema was present, which was fitting in nature, JVP was not raised, skin and hair was normal, there was no xanthal asthma, no moon faces. Pulse was 80 per minute, regular in rhythm, normal volume, felt in all accessible peripheral vessels. There was no radio radial or radio femoral delay. BP was 130 by 80 millimeter of mercury in the right upper limb supine and 140 by 8, 80 in right upper limb while sitting. Or lower limb examination, there was swelling was ext. Fitting edema was present up to the knees. Skin over the legs was stretched and shiny. There was no ulceration and no dilated tortuous veins. On palpation, there was no tenderness, no calf tenderness. And fitting uh, was present on pressure. And her height was 170 centimeters and weight was 60 kg and BMI 20.8 kg per meter square. On systemic examination, you initially told left swelling she presented with left feet swelling now. So this was uh, during the time of admission. That was during the follow-up when she, she had okay, just... Fine. On systemic examination, CNS, she was conscious or oriented. All her 
Peripheral nervous system was normal. Chest um, was moving well with the respiration. On auscultation, bilateral normal vascular breath sounds were present. Serious apical impulse was in the fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. Both the heart sounds were heard and there was no murmur. For abdomen, the, on inspection, there was an oblique scar in the right high, uh, subcostal region. M abdomen wa was moving well with the respiration. The scar was healthy, there was no herniation, the abdomen was not distended. On palpation, there was no tenderness, no organomegaly and no free fluid. There so what did it contribute to your examination? How did it contribute to your history? So on examination, the only positive finding was the lower limb swelling which was spitting in nature up to the knee joint. So that means if a history has been taken well, you could probably anticipate what you're seeing in the general and systemic examination. examination. What did you specifically look for in your general and systemic examination? So first I, I looked for the side effects of uh, steroids because she had been taking steroids uh, four times for a long period of five, six months. There were no features suggestive of any toxicity or prolonged Surprising. use of... Uh, so you look for steroid side effects. Yes, okay. Sir. Then what else did you specifically look for? Sir, I look for features of fluid overload like... Nee, that's, along with that's common to all nephrotic states. Yes. So here's an elderly lady who's come with nephrotic syndrome. Mm. What did you specifically look for in the general examination? Sir, there was no lymphadenopathy, so that, uh, with that I tried to rule out malignancies like lymphomas. So there are no all the possibilities we discussed could be causing a secondary nephrotic syndrome, yes, a secondary sir. cause. You looked for the secondary cause. You looked for malignancy by looking for the lymph nodes. Yes looking for hepatosplenomegaly. Yes. Did you examine the breast? Yes, sir. So there were no lumps in the breast? No, sir. Okay. You looked, where else did you look for? Abdomen, I tried to palpate the organs, whether any malignancy, because she... She came with dysphagia, no? She, she came, came with, with dysphagia. difficulty in swallowing. Sorry. So what did you do? With Sir, upper GI endoscopy was done. Examination mein ho na abhi aap. On oral cavity, sir, I have not. So, when a patient comes with dysphagia, let's go into a little bit of medicine. Mm -hmm. When a patient comes with dysphagia, what could be the possible causes? Dysphagia, painful dysphagia could be some inflammatory cause. Some infective cause. But yet painful ni hai, na? She Nein, just pa painful sir. Achha, she uh, came with painful pain. swallowing. Yes, sir. Okay. And only two solids. And she was comfortable with soft diet. Okay. Neck examination showed anything? No. So besides looking for lymph nodes, you must mention about the thyroid gland. Okay, no? Sir. Because you're looking for a malignancy. Yes. And she's coming to you with dysphagia. You must look for thyroid gland. You will say... You should have mentioned when you opened the mouth, what did you see in the mouth? No, what was the throat? What was the tonsils like? She's come with dysphagia. Yes. And she's come with nephrotic state. So you can't get away by examination of, not doing examination of the neck and examination of the throat. So these two things probably should have been done in this patient. Hmm? Okay. Now tell us the investigations. So her hemoglobin was 9.4, total lymphocyte count was 6,300, platelet 1,62,000, urea was 56, creatinine at this time was 2, Ure total uric acid was 2.5, total serum bilirubin was 0 0.48, 
AST was 18.4, ALT was 24, serum albumin was 2.2, Vitamin B12 was 1317, folate level was... How much was B12? 1370. Lipid profile, total serum cholesterol was 354. Triglycerides were 284. VLDL was 205. Her C3 was within the normal range, 89. C4 was 31. PLA2 receptor antibodies were negative. Uh, tumor marker CA 12, was 12.5, CEA was 19.9. Peripheral uh, smear showed normocytic, uh, normochromic anemia with retic count of 1.2%. Mammography was done. Bilar's what about score. urine? Sir, I am coming. Are, ma mammography is <laughs> <point gai. laughs> urine. urine. Sir, so, urine examination showed... Uh, Specific gravity was 1.0. Protein, 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 batao kitna. Urine, uh, sir, we have quantified the urine. Uh, protein. Dipstick was uh, 4 plus. Urine uh, total volume was 900 ml. Urine albumin creatinine ratio was 12,841 milligram per gram. And urine uh, protein creatinine ratio was 14,090 milligram per gram. 24 hours urine protein was done, which was 10.5 grams per day. Her DEXA scan was done. We showed T score. Let's stop at that. Let's stop at that. Right? So, who would like to take up the investigations? Yeah, anyone. Come. <coughs> what do you make out by all the investigations that she has presented? So, based on the urine examination, uh, protein is four plus. Would you like to tell them if there are any RBCs he wants to know? Sir, there were no RBCs. Epithelial cells 1 to 2. Any CAS? No CAS. No CAS, no RBCs, no epithelial, epithelial cells 1 to 2 and pus cells 1 to 2. Okay. So, sir, we have uh, photos protein on the and then we have a planned So you think your patient has got a nephrotic syndrome. So how do you define the nephrotic syndrome? Let's ask the first one. Yeah, how do you define nephrotic syndrome? Which uh, hospital are you from? PSI. Yes, PSI. Yes, Which year? Uh, second. Second. How do you define nephrotic syndrome? Uh, nephrotic, uh, nephrotic, uh, nephrotic syndrome is defined by proteinuria, uh, 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 nephrotic range more than 4 grams. Would you like to reduce the range of proteinuria? 3.5. Okay, 3 to 3.5, okay. And uh, quantify the albumin also. You have to quantify. So there is proteinuria, there is hypoalbuminemia, there is edema. Why is edema so important? Why am I mentioning edema? And it may be accompanied by hyperlipidemia. So why am I mentioning edema? Can you have 4 gram or 5 gram protein with edema and without edema? Very good. What is that? For example, a patient goes into hypoalbuminemia if the patient is on CAPD or because of some nutritional cause, they don't develop edema. No? So, what is so peculiar about the edema of nephrotic syndrome? Why do they develop edema when they have hypoalbuminemia? So, why? Hypatic compensation doesn't take place in nephrotic states. It does, but uh, the quantity of protein in there is higher than the compensation. No, for example, when he was talking about secondary, no, in secondary FSGS, you may have a lot of protein in the urine, 
but they don't have edema. But primary FSGS, you have that much of proteinuria, you have edema. So why? You are, you are close to it. So suppose there is protein leak in the urine. Albumin has to be synthesized from somewhere, no? Where is it synthesized? It's synthesized in the liver. In nephrotic syndrome, we are not very clear, but we suspect that there are interleukins which inhibit the compensatory response from the liver. That is why we talk about edema in nephrotic syndrome. Now, what is the mechanism of edema? So, what are the two hypotheses? So, what is underfill? And absorption of salt and water. And what is overfill? Say it again. What is this inac channel he is talking about? Epithelial sodium channel. Where are they present? In the distal. So there is a defect and there is increased absorption of salt and water. So this is the underfill and overfill uh, hypothesis for edema. Now why do they have hypertriglyceridemia and why do they have hypercholesterolemia? <laughs> That leads to increased cholesterol levels. But what about triglycerides? How are triglycerides formed? There is decreased activity of the enzyme converting what to what? Triglycerides are in which part of lipoprotein? VLDL, LDL, HDL, or LDL? LDL has what? Cholesterol. VLDL has got the triglycerides. So there is decreased conversion, decreased activity of the enzyme which breaks down. I think it is VLDL. That is why the triglyceride levels go up in these people. Okay, now what is the significance of knowing the albumin levels? We, he, she said it was 2.2. 2. So, what is the the Why should you put them on anticoagulants? So because it has a uh, as such. In less than 2.5 so it is a it has increased propensity for coagulation. Why? So because of active the increase uh, uh, loss in the antibiotic third is lost. Protein C. Protein C. Protein C. Also loss. So there is loss of anticoagulant proteins in the urine along with the loss of other proteins that are going on. No? That's why it leads to a thrombotic state, a hypercoagulable state, and you use anticoagulants in them. Then she spoke something about anemia, hemoglobin 9.4. Why do you think this patient has got a hemoglobin of 9.4? Suppose the creatinine was 0.6, but the hemoglobin is 9.4. Loss of iron binding proteins in the urine, that's why they develop iron deficiency anemia. Now, can you link that iron deficiency anemia with her dysphagia and nephrotic syndrome? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, so you get that. Okay. Now, PLA2 is negative. 
the markers that you know, no, I, I'll not go to that. Uh, you tell me what are the special tests you did to rule out a secondary cause? So, once we did this mammography, other we did upper GI endoscopy for her dysphagia and also to rule out any GI malignancy. Upper GI endoscopy was suggestive of hiatus hernia, which was 5 cm. Mammography was also unremarkable. Uh, we planned for a colonoscopy, but she refused. And uh, her occult blood was also negative. So. Occult blood was negative. Yes. So you could not come to a secondary cause. Yes. No? Now, could you tell us the biopsy report? Yes. Uh, the first biopsy, which was done In uh, 2017. Before we go to the biopsy report, let me stop. So, which, what diseases are you thinking of which will respond to steroids? She was given steroids. Every time she was given steroids, she responded. And finally, they got fed up and put, put her on Visalon and TAC. So, what are you thinking of? And one is minimal chain disease and FSGS. And could it be membranous? So if it was membranous, probably a different regime would have been given to this lady. So you're thinking it could be MCD or it could be FSGS. OK. This is biopsy, which was done first time in 2017. So should I read the full biopsy report? Yeah, let one of them interpret. Clinical diagnosis, nephrotic syndrome, specimen, nature, native kidney biopsy for right, microscopic and immunofluorescence, single coat, 10 mm in depth, Vasen, and one HNE stain, one pass, one uh, Mason's trichome, and one James, Jones uh, methamine uh, stain was done. A single core reveals 13 glomerulae, all of which were morphologically unremarkable. Tubular interstitial compartment shows no significant abnormality. Vascular compartment shows intimal sclerosis in medium sized vessel. The smaller arterioles are unremarkable. Immunofluorescence IgG, IgA, IgM were negative. C3 was negative. C1Q negative. Kappa lambda negative. Impression was normal morphology consistent with minimal change disease was it sent for em also yes sir. yeah what let ultra structural evaluation of a of a glomerulus reveals basement membrane which are uniform and are of normal thickness no immune type electron dense deposits are present along with gbm or within the mesangium globally noted is extensive food process effacement Microvillus transformation in addition to vacuolation in podocytes. Okay. So we are dealing with minimal chain disease in an adult. Yes. So what would be the causes for minimal chain disease in elderly? It would not differ no, from what we have yes. already discussed. Yes. No, it would be the same. It, yes. is, it doesn't Primary differ. And secondary Primary causes. and secondary causes. So, what is new which has come up in minimal chain disease? Immune made. It could be immune mediated. Yeah, very good. So, it could be an immunological disease. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the antigen that they are talking about? Before you go to that, why do you have heavy proteinuria? Why do you have proteinuria? Actually, you know, in medicine, even I'm making that mistake, we should not be using adjectives. So why do you have proteinuria? OK. What are the causes for proteinuria in a nephrotic state, nephrotic syndrome? 
I'm talking about the pathogenesis. What do you think happens to the basement membrane? Which part of the basement membrane is affected that you should have proteinuria? One, you mentioned effacement of photocytes. So what happens if there is effacement? How does the basement membrane prevent leak of protein in the urine? So the, the negative charge is... One is the charge. The second is the cytoskeleton. And what are the proteins which make the cytoskeleton? Nephrin. Nephrin and? Podocin. Nephrin, podocin, and there is one more. Uh, clap, clathri, I'm sorry, I forget that name. But nephrin and podocin. So now they have demonstrated anti-nephrin antibodies. And that is the mechanism how steroids act because you are controlling the antibody production. Okay. So when the second biopsy was done, what did it show? One linear core, 0.8 centimeter in formalin for light microscopy. Light mos microscopy, HNE, two slides were prepared, PAS1 and John Silver Methamin 1 and Mason Strikom 1. Native kidney biopsy, one core of cortex only with nine glomeruli, of which one is globally sclerosed. Three demonstrate segmental sclerosis along with podocyte hypertrophy. No hypercellularity, capillary walls unremarkable. No evidence of endocapillary hypercellularity, mesangial hypercellularity, exudation. No, no what capillary about wall signal. IF. IF, IgA, IgG negative, IgM, 1 to 2 mesangial granular pattern seen, C3, C1, Q negative, kappa and lambda negative. So there is, when you say IgM is seen, where is the IgM trapping? In the mesangial. Is it in the sclerotic segments? You can have non-specific IgM in the sclerotic segments. So now what is your diagnosis? Sir, so, uh, focal segmented glomerulosclerosis because three of the glomeruli are showing this sclerosis. So how come the first biopsy was only MCD? Sir, so in 25 to 30% of biopsies, there are chances of missing because... Because of its nature, it is focal, focal and, and it is segmented. Segment. So you may miss. Okay, so now that you got focal segmental, how did it change your treatment? So the duration of the therapy will increase plus... Why was tecrolimus added? So this time her kidney functions were also deranged. deranged. So why was tecrolimus added then? Because uh, when she came to us, uh, her uh, edema were, had not decreased in spite of giving initially steroids only. No, I'm, no, no, my question was not that. Mm. We are dealing with a steroid responsive nephrotic syndrome. syndrome. No? Yes. Sir. First time she responded to steroids, second time she responded to steroids. Now she's come the third time to you mm. and you added tecrolimus. So, what are the options available to you before you think of tecrolin? Because already there is some dysfunction of the kidney. Yes, sir. And now you've added tecrolin. So it's probably going to worsen the kidney function. So what else you can add? So the cyclophosphamide, MMF. And? Uh, rituximab. And rituximab. Yes. So, I don't know, this you should take over. Yeah. The, the evidence that rituximab can be used in steroid responsive nephrotic syndromes. So, first you classify how, which type of steroid, I mean, there are different types. Steroid dependent, is, is she steroid dependent, frequent relapsing, infrequent relapse, or which category she is coming into as per She's, uh, the description? Steroid responsive. But uh, 
infrequent relapse is because she is having every year, almost every six, seven months, she she has been uh, have symptom free. So there, are, according to definition, she is not having more than two relapses uh, per six months. Okay, and is she steroid dependent? Do you think she classify into that category? No, sir. Like um, in between her steroids were stopped. She was asymptomatic for three to four months. And the present episode, is it now what type of dependence or resist or anything? I mean, any specific, you want to specify that present status, present this relapse or present episode? Present, uh, maybe she was not able to take uh, her medication orally or maybe, and we also didn't see any response after giving for about 15-20 days. There was no reduction and she was not able to tolerate the steroids. So we added tacrolimus. So you're using this tacrolimus as a steroid sparing agent, is it? Yes. You want to withdraw it early? Yes. Or is it steroid resistant now? What is the specify? Can you specify further with the history and with the therapeutic response which she got? Till now, she has been responsive. There was no resistance. Right. But this time, is it now, can you call it steroid resistant now? How will you call a person steroid resistant? This patient is steroid resistant. Over. When, when there is no it? decrease in protein urea in spite of uh, standard dose of uh, steroids. On second day, on 15th day, and then it's something you have to specify. Yeah, after 16 weeks ah, of okay. uh, standard dose. So she didn't qualify for that, steroid mm -hmm. resistant also. Yes. So you had you had other choices also, did you discuss that? You had other choices of immunosuppressions apart from tacrolimus. Yes, sir. Retox we discussed, but uh, cost was an issue. What is the protocol that, I mean, the, what are the evidences of using rituximab in this sort of setting? We can give four, uh, one to four doses. There's no much literature about how much the fixed doses. But 375 milligram per uh, 1.73 square meter, we can give one to four doses. 375 per meter square? Yes, sure. per one meter. So, the dosing schedule is anything it can be either four doses of what you mentioned or, two. or it can be one gram given yes. two weeks apart two but weeks. rituximab can be used in steroid dependent minimal change disease yes. but what i'm more interested is that why is there graft dysfunction a graft i mean sorry why is the, has the creatinine gone up yes. so that is what we should be looking for that here is a patient who was doing so well for three years and now suddenly the creatinine has gone up to two. No? So what will you think of? First, you must think of non-immunological causes for the creatinine going up. Non-immunological causes for AKI. So what are they? So like she was not able to take orally and she had... So it could be pre renal. Pre renal. One. Yeah. Then? Always exclude when the pro proteinuria is not coming down a renal vein thrombosis. So you must always do a Doppler and look for renal veins, patency of renal veins. Before you jump to the next stage of immunosuppression, look for non immunological causes for not responding. One is if the patient has taken NSAIDs, no? The second is if there is renal vein thrombosis. Anything else that comes to your mind? Diuretics. Or if there has been overzealous use of diuretics, right? So think of these common things and then you go on to further immunosuppression, whatever it is. Is it better to leave her alone rather than keep on hitting her with immunosuppression? Put her on high dose of ABS and leave her alone. Mm. 
So now she has renal dysfunction also, and her protein urea is so much. So have uh, we added an ARB along with the treatment? Yes, sir. So would it have been better just to give her ARBs and not exhibited steroids? So, but ARBs with uh, tablet Telma was continuing. In spite of that, she developed the, so much edema too. That would have not have been uh, sufficient. So I think the lesson I'll take from this presentation is that next time I'll always do a Doppler for renal vein and look for thrombosis of renal vein in a person who is not responding. But she didn't have any evidence of hematuria or yeah, anything. Yeah, so that is acute. That's why we didn't... That is acute renal vein thrombosis. Mm -hmm. When they come with chronic progressive renal vein thrombosis, they don't have hematuria. They come with massive proteinuria. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing when you go back, get the renal vein screened to see if it is involved. There is one history of asymmetric leg swelling, so maybe, though you told it's probably varicose, but then yes. it could have been DVT and then yes. associated, right? Hypercoagulant. The only doctor we got done, it was normal. Okay. Yeah, I think we should stop here. So, we've had a plain and simple case of minimal <laughs> chain disease and nephrotic syndrome. What are the points that I'd like you to take home and go? One is you may miss FSGS in a biopsy, uh, but generally when you have FSGS and you don't have any changes in the glomeruli, it is the interstitium which gives you the clue that there is uh, something more than what you are seeing. So always in a biopsy, try to look for that. Second thing is that IgM positivity can be nonspecific. It could be trapping in a sclerotic segment, although when present, it supports the diagnosis of FSGS. Third thing is, when you talk about FSGS, you must tell us the four types of FSGS that you see. Can yes. you tell us that? Yes, sir. There, there are four types. Histological Tip variants, <laughs> that's the correct word. Huh. Four types. Tip variant then cellular histology, not otherwise specified, and perihidas. And, yeah, and, and the collapsing type of FSGS that yes. they have. The other lesson then after this I wanted to take home is that what are the secondary causes of FSGS and minimal chain disease which are very important. How do you distinguish secondary from primary that you mentioned? on the role of uh, edema, which is the differentiating factor. Then the other important point is that when you step up, immun patient is not responding to your immunosuppression, look for non-immunological causes, especially where there is graft dysfunction. Graft, again I'm saying using the wrong word, when the, when the creatinine levels have also gone up. Yeah, it should have it should have progressed gradually. But it probably is a minimal change disease. And that's why I'm saying look for other causes. What has caused now this sclerosis to come up? Is there anything else that we should have told them? Yeah, the last point before we break off. Why do we look for albumin and protein leak in the urine? He, she mentioned both. She mentioned albumin creatinine ratio and protein creatinine ratio. No, but in this you are not looking. This is not selective, non-selective. Selective is when you are looking for tubular protein ureas. This is not that. Overflow yeah, protein urea. so you must always remember that in plasma cell dysgracias, there may be a discordance between the albumin leak and the protein leak. So if you look at only albumin, you may be missing yes. a myeloma kidney. Hmm? I think with that, I should, I have finished. No, thank you.
उसको भी वन लास्ट ट्रिक क्वेश्चन फॉर यू ऑल वॉट इज दल्टीज क्रॉस बेबी सोसिस वॉट वॉट इज द मेल्टीज क्रॉस गिवन इन आर्मी ओ नो आई नेवर गॉट इट वॉट इज द मल्टीज क्रॉस एनी वन इज गुड टू गो इन टू द हिस्ट्री यू नो वेन यू रीड यू ऑल डोंट हैव टाइम बट वी हैव ऑल द टाइम टू रीड इन टू हिस्ट्री सो मल्टीज क्रॉस इज अ मेडल इन द मेडिवियल टाइम्स when they were holy crusades you know what are the holy crusades so holy crusades were when the uh, christians used to fight against the non christians so when they used to go into battle against these non christians those people used to throw oil like substance on them coat them with that and then flame them so when they used to flame them they used to light up huh on all sides of their body and uh, that same light up shield which used to come up we started giving to people who were in the fire fighters in the west that they were as brave as those people who went on the crusade and that was the maltese cross so in these people with nephrotic syndrome when they have lipiduria and you look under the microscope there you find it lighting up when you look under the polarizing light you find it lighting up like a maltese cross so that is very characteristic of lipiduria so it's a good question if you're doing well in exam and someone comes you can tell them i'd like to know about the maltese cross in the urine no okay thik thank you